Hi everyone, it's Katrina. The New Grange Tomb. The New Grange Tomb was built 5,000 years ago by a mysterious civilization that even today we know very little about. It's a Neolithic structure in Ireland that can still be used for celebrating the winter solstice all these thousands of years later. Every year on December 21st, the shortest day of the year, sunlight beams through the main corridor that leads into the chamber of the tomb, flooding 60 feet of stone passage in warm yellow light. Clearly, the people who built the tomb knew what they were doing. Above the structure itself, which is tucked inside a grassy mound, there is a small roof aligned perfectly with the rising sun. Additionally, the central mound is surrounded by 97 stones carved into pieces of megalithic artwork. It's just as striking as the more widely known Stonehenge, but older by several centuries. It probably had a very similar, if not the same, purpose as Stonehenge across the water in England. It was used for spiritual and religious ceremonies, all having to do with the different times of the year and the seasons. We just don't know what those ceremonies looked like. We also don't know much about the ancient people who built it, other than that they were likely a farming community who somehow taught themselves the secrets of the stars. Sigiriya Sigiriya is the most fascinating magical place in all of Sri Lanka. It's an ancient fortress built atop a huge pillar of rock, overlooking endless miles of forest in every direction. It's also known as Lion's Rock and was once home to a great palace over 600 feet in the air. The only way to the top of the rock is by climbing a great stairway. The stairway starts on the ground, its entranceway jammed between a pair of huge stone lion paws. Archaeologists believe there was a huge lion statue here once, even bigger than the Sphinx in Egypt, but it has since vanished. All that's left are the toes of the feet. The palace at the top was built in the Middle Ages during the Datusena dynasty, but the rock was being used way before that, all the way back in the 3rd century BC by Buddhist monks. They used Sigiriya as a place of meditation. It was considered holy, a great place of spiritual magic that attracted Buddhists from all over the country, even from India. The palace and fortress were used up until the year 495. That was when King Kasapa I was defeated and Sigiriya was handed back to the Buddhist monks. Shortly after, the Buddhist cult known as Sangha opened one of their most important churches here. Egyptian Priest of Magic Archaeologists in Egypt have just discovered the tomb of an Egyptian priest, revealed to be a priest dedicated to magic from 4,500 years ago. The mysterious tomb was uncovered at Abu Sir Archaeological Cemetery in Giza, sealed from the world until its recent discovery. The tomb belonged to someone named Shepseskaf Ankh, who was both a priest and a magician. The tomb was discovered to be enormous, 45 feet long and 13 feet high. The sheer size of the tomb shows just how important this man had been in life during the fifth dynasty of the Old Kingdom. By translating the hieroglyphics on the sealed door of his tomb, experts learned his many titles. He was called Priest of Kunum, Priest of Magic, and was also an important royal physician. If you were able to practice magic in ancient Egypt, you were also able to tend to the medical necessities of royalty. After all, magic and medicine weren't that far apart. If you knew how to heal the body, you were capable of wondrous things. The tomb itself was found in a necropolis between Giza and Saqqara. Even this long ago, Giza had become just too full of monuments. There was no more space to be building pyramids and complex underground tombs, so the builders started straying further and further away, to the lost city of Saqqara. But by now you probably want to know how this man was so magical. How could he be a physician and a wielder of magic at the same time? The truth is that in ancient Egypt, these things were one and the same. Physicians had many different techniques to heal people, and a lot of them had to do with magic. They would speak to the gods, banish curses, mix concoctions out of herbs, whatever they needed to appear effective. The reality is that he probably didn't possess any actual supernatural powers. He probably knew a lot about medicine and combined his scientific knowledge with as much spiritual showmanship as possible. What do you think? Tell me your thoughts in the comments. The Karnak Stones the Karnak Stones is another prehistoric place of magic built by an enigmatic civilization in Europe. These megalithic stones can be found today near the village of Karnak in France. The stones show that whoever built them had an advanced knowledge of geometry, and according to what we know today, 
This knowledge seems way too advanced for prehistoric people over 5,300 years ago. Experts believe the stones were erected by a group of humans who came even before the Celts. Yet why they bothered putting up over 3,000 standing stones, a task that would have taken years to complete, is a major mystery. Scientists and scholars alike have been trying to decode the Karnak stones with very little success. And to make things even more difficult, many of the stones have vanished. This is due in large part to the site having been generally neglected and even taken over in some areas by sheep. Since the stones have been sitting around for so long, it's likely people stole them to build other projects or if they've just been mostly buried by dirt. What we do know is that the Karnak stones are the biggest collection of megalithic standing stones anywhere on the planet. The entire place was likely treated as a magical center where the community elders taught astrology and astronomy which were probably one back in those days. Some experts believe it's possible the stones were erected in imitation of the stars above, made to mimic constellations in the sky. The Garden of Eden In 1994, a shepherd in eastern Turkey accidentally discovered what very well could be the legendary Garden of Eden. To this day, his accidental discovery of a group of standing stones is considered by some to be the greatest in archaeological history. The site that he found was soon excavated by the famous German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt and is known today as Gobekli Tepe, one of the oldest known archaeological sites anywhere in the world. It's mysterious for a lot of reasons, but mostly its age. Gobekli Tepe is estimated at around 13,000 years old built 7,000 years before Stonehenge and 6,500 years before the pyramids in Giza. Not only is it older than every other major site in the world, it's older by a tremendous margin. This was a time when cavemen were the dominant force and culture. People were still very primitive. It seems ridiculous that they could have built a grand city out of stone when, as far as we know, even language or communication was limited. And yet there is no denying the results of the carbon dating. But here's where things get more magical. There are some who believe Gobekli Tepe was the infamous Garden of Eden spoken of in the Bible. Researchers have discovered inscriptions of boars, ducks, crayfish, lions, and even serpents. Clearly, what is now a barren desert was once flourishing with life. And because the site is so old, it almost seems as if the only way it could have been built on Earth was if God, or the gods, came down and built it themselves for humans to enjoy. The Enchanted River Deep in the jungles of the Philippines, there is a mystical stretch of river that comes out of virtually nowhere and sends its water flowing into the sea. It's called the Hinatuan Enchanted River, located in Mindanao. The saltwater river is 80 feet deep in some parts and hardly long enough to even be considered a river. Yet it has been seen as a place of miracles since antiquity. Because the river looks as though it comes out of the ground and has no visible source, the ancient people who lived here believed it was magical in origin. Even modern scientists don't know exactly where the salt water comes from. Most theories say there is an underground cave system that shoots the river literally out of the earth, but this has never been confirmed. What makes it even more mysterious is that the river is totally clear, much like a freshwater spring would be. The river was never said to have any particular magic, Instead, there are a lot of elaborate legends surrounding it. Locals say fairies once dumped sapphires and jade pieces into the water, turning it shades of blue and green. They also say the river is home to a magical fish that nobody can catch. I want to give a big shout out to Diane Suisfo and Danny Green KP. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button and join the Origins Explained family. Sweden's Island of Witches. These days, the Swedish island of Bladjungfrun is a national park, but many years ago it was believed to be a terrifying place of horrors where witches allegedly practiced evil magic. According to some archaeological discoveries made in the past few years, this might actually be true. The island itself is in the Baltic Sea, nothing but a small chunk of blue granite less than a mile long. It's been an ominous place for as far back as the local folklore goes. Its original name was Blakula. However, locals refused to say it because they believed as soon as you said the island's name, it would create a series of storms that could wipe out ships. In the 16th century, witches were said to gather on the island the day before Good Friday to meet the devil. As if that wasn't bad enough, the rest of the year, the island was home to female supernatural beings. These beings had the power to harm or help. 
Some people would secretly travel to the island and leave offerings on its shores in a desperate attempt to gain favor with the mysterious beings. But some people wanted the beings to use their power to cause others harm. The evidence of this is in the form of a labyrinth. The ruins of a strange stone labyrinth can still be found on the island today. No one knows where it came from or who built it, and nobody knows what its purpose was. But the locals suspect it was somehow connected to the witches and their nefarious deeds. Mayong The ancient village of Mayong was once the black magic capital of India. The quiet village sits on the edge of the Brahmaputra River and looks like any other village in the region. But its origin goes back to the days of ancient Assam. It's mentioned in the mythological epic the Mahabharata, a religious text that tells the story of some of Hinduism's gods and goddesses and an epic battle amongst heroes and gods alike. It's a book filled with stories and legends that live on to this day. In the book, the village of Mayong is where Chief Gatot Kacha received magical powers. From this ancient story, myths around the villages began to form. Even in modern times, locals believe witches live in the dense jungles outside the village and continue to practice black magic. There are other suspicious activities that have happened in the city as well. The villagers can tell you countless stories of men vanishing into thin air, people turning into wild beasts, and even one instance of a witch making an entire group of over 100,000 horsemen disappear. Naturally, there is no proof of these wild tales, but for over a thousand years, Mayong has been seen as a dark and magical place in India, somewhere most locals apparently avoid. Mount Olympus we have all undoubtedly heard of Mount Olympus, the heavenly home of all the most important Greek gods in the classical pantheon. Zeus reigned over Mount Olympus, accompanied by his wife Hera, his brother Poseidon, his sisters, his children, and all the Olympians from mythology. Have you ever wondered where Mount Olympus actually is? And for that matter, is it really a place of magic? There are several peaks in Greece, Turkey, and Cyprus, all named Olympus. But the one with the most credibility is near the city of Thessaloniki in the north of Greece, the tallest mountain range in the whole country. The highest peak here is 9,570 feet tall. Since before the days of Christianity, the mountain has been considered sacred. It was once believed to exude spiritual power. It was so famous that it drew hermits and monks from all over Europe to live in its caves and forests. It wasn't until the coming of Christianity when people stopped visiting the holy mountain. These days, the only magic left on Olympus is its natural splendor. There are very few pilgrims, the forests are quiet, and people have given up believing in Zeus and his kin. Black Magic Worship Historians discovered an underground worship chamber used in magical pagan ceremonies 40 feet beneath an old Roman ruin. It was built by a mysterious cult who painted the walls of the chamber an eerie blood red. The chamber dates back at least 2,000 years and is located beneath the streets of Rome. It was uncovered by accident in 1917 during the construction of a new railway line on the outskirts of the city. An underground passageway collapsed, revealing the entrance to the secret chamber. Its walls were found covered in pictures of gods and heroes from classical mythology, such as Achilles and Hercules. At the entrance is the imposing and gruesome head of Medusa, as well as carvings of centaurs and satyrs. It predates Christianity and is so far the only one of its kind ever found. This is one of the most bizarre magical places in Rome, a pagan basilica built underground. In the first century BC, historians believe it was used as a school for mystical teachings based on the philosophical writings of Pythagoras and Plato. It was likely built by an influential Roman family headed by Titus Statilius Taurus. This man was investigated by the Senate for practicing black magic and conducting secret illicit ceremonies underground. He never went to trial because he was found dead shortly after the accusations in the year 53. After that, his fellow cultists had to go even deeper underground. The basilica was sealed, forgotten, and buried under the streets of Rome. Montezuma Castle Montezuma Castle in Arizona stands 90 feet above the valley floor and is one of the most fascinating structures built by ancient people in North America. Interestingly enough, it was Teddy Roosevelt in 1906 who gave the presidential office the power to create national monuments. One of the very first ones he chose was Montezuma Castle in Camp Verde. Teddy Roosevelt recognized the importance of this historical place and wanted to preserve it for all the generations to come. 
Despite its name, Montezuma Castle is not really a castle in the traditional sense. It doesn't have spire towers and huge ramparts. Instead, it's more of a cliff fortress, a large settlement carved into the side of a massive piece of rock over 1,000 years ago. But that's not the only part of this place's name that's a little misleading. When archaeologists first came upon it, they thought the cliff fortress had been built by the Aztec, hence the name Montezuma. But in reality, it was the indigenous Sinagua people of the Verde Valley who built the structure. The reason they built it high up on the limestone cliff is actually pretty simple. They used the place like a modern apartment building, only reachable by a series of really long fire escapes. If they ever came under attack by a rival tribe, they could simply scurry up their ladders, pull the ladders up, and then hide in their castle until the threat was gone. The Walls of Uruk the Epic of Gilgamesh is an ancient piece of literature that tells the mythological tale of a Mesopotamian demigod, a superhuman named Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh completes a number of tasks and goes on many adventures, with one of his greatest adventures being oddly similar to that of Noah in the Bible. It's said Gilgamesh survived a great flood that wiped away much of the life on the planet, a flood of what you might call biblical proportions. Another thing Gilgamesh did is building the greater outer walls of the city of Uruk to defend all the people of Mesopotamia from their enemies. Now, we can't say if Gilgamesh really existed. He supposedly lived 126 years and completed nearly as many impossible labors as Hercules. Some historians have even speculated that the Greek hero Hercules is based on the figure of Gilgamesh. Other historians say Gilgamesh was the fifth king of Uruk, whose influence was so grand and deeds so profound that he transcended the world of man and became a legend. Whatever the case with Gilgamesh, we know Uruk was real. It was the largest settlement in Mesopotamia around the year 4500 BC and did indeed have huge, powerful walls to keep out enemies. The walls were so large that the story of them has lasted over 6,000 years. The sad part is that there's almost nothing left of these great walls today, except their foundations. Gumuzla Gumuzla is a Byzantine cave monastery carved out of solid rock in the modern country of Turkey. It was constructed not that long ago, only about 1,300 years, you know. It became a center for religious learning and home to a group of monks. But what makes the monastery truly unique is the way it was built. It was carved out of a single rock formation and consists of a massive square courtyard in the center, a church, and a subterranean lair of rooms, passageways, crypts, and dwellings for the monks. It's almost a subterranean cave city. The monastery was built after the fall of the original Roman Empire and during the reign of the Eastern Roman Empire, also called the Byzantine Empire. After Rome fell and chaos swallowed Europe, a new power rose from the ashes miles away from Italy in Turkey, with its capital of Constantinople, what's today Istanbul. Researchers believe there were three different master artists involved in painting the artwork found within the monastery. These artists were so good that over a millennium later, their works are still some of the best preserved frescoes in the region. They depicted scenes of Christ, heavenly angels, gospel writers, Mary and the disciples. The cave monastery remained a complete secret to the Western world until 1962, when the artwork was published by a local Turkish historian. The Sechen Culture Pyramid In Peru's northern province of Kazma, archaeologists discovered a mysterious ancient pyramid structure about 5,000 years old. They believe this incredible structure came from the first Andean civilization to ever rise in Peru, the Sechen Culture. Historians know very little about the Sechen. While they built some of the first monumental buildings in South America, and they may have been the first complex society on the continent, that's pretty much the extent of our knowledge. The issue is that all their buildings are so old, they've either been ruined, completely buried, or used as material for newer structures after the Sechin vanished. The Sechin people left behind very little in the way of artwork and nothing written. This pyramid was discovered deep under the ground. A team of special archaeologists and excavators had to dig down roughly 18 feet and move huge pieces of stone out of their way just to get to the steps of the pyramid. But despite being buried under dirt for so long, the pyramid is in shockingly good condition. It was about 15 feet wide at the bottom and 10 feet tall. 
This might be obviously quite a bit smaller when compared to later pyramids in Egypt and Mesoamerica, but it is still a pyramid. The pyramid was not the only thing archaeologists uncovered during excavations. They also found human skulls and evidence of sacrifices. One of these skeletons appeared to have had their limbs severed while they were still alive. Researchers believe the miniature pyramid may have been one of the first sites in Peru used for human sacrifices. All the killings that came later, the mere idea of sacrificing a human life to appease a god, may have begun right here on the top of this very pyramid. The Temple of Hera The Temple of Hera is one of the coolest and strangest monuments ever built by the powerful ancient Greeks. Construction on the temple began in the 7th century BC, and it was originally used for the worship of both Zeus and Hera. It was also originally made out of wood, but over the years, the wood was replaced with stone. Zeus was eventually pushed out in favor of his wife, and the master of Olympus got his own temple built nearby. A huge statue of Hera was built here, with her giant head being discovered in modern times buried underneath the temple. The temple's main purpose, other than being an altar of worship to Hera, was for storing the most important items in Greek culture. It was almost like a museum, holding extremely valuable objects as well as offerings to Zeus and Hera. There was a great statue of Hermes holding the baby Dionysus stored in the temple's basement, a small bronze disc called the Ephytus of Elis, and a table of olive wreaths from each victor of the Olympic Games. In fact, the temple was such an important part of Olympic culture in Greece that it is still used today to light the Olympic flame. Sadly, the temple is in pretty rough shape. During the Roman period, they shut the temple down because of their persecution of pagans. Then, in the 4th century AD, it was all but destroyed by an earthquake. The Beehive Tombs of Oman The Beehive Tombs of Oman are mysterious yet captivating. They can be found in the rugged, mountainous interior of the Arabian Peninsula at one of the most impressive and least investigated archaeological sites in the Middle East. The entire area is dotted in these unusual tombs that look like standing beehives. According to the researchers, these tombs are the leftover remnants of an ancient civilization that once ruled the desolate landscape here. These days, the closest functioning city is 15 miles from the tombs. And even though I say city, it's not exactly a bustling metropolis. That makes the tombs isolated and far from major civilization. But that wasn't always the case. These used to belong to a powerful Bronze Age civilization. UNESCO has declared the whole area a fossilized Bronze Age landscape, while the archaeological evidence says this was once the land of Magan, spoken of in ancient Akkadian cuneiform texts. The land of Magan was described by the ancient kings of Mesopotamia and their scribes as a place of great resources and hungry for conquest. 4,000 years ago, there was a lot more than beehive tombs here. There would have been towers, settlements, cities, and all kinds of amazing constructions. The issue is that time has not been friendly to the land of Magan. Everything except the tombs has been reduced to rubble. And now for number four. But first, if you are new here, welcome! And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about amazing archaeological discoveries. The City of Nakum The entire city of Nakum was a brilliant feat of engineering on the part of the Maya. A recent study has shown how engineers in Nakum constructed the city to direct rainwater from the tops of the buildings and other structures into nearby reservoirs to be used by the residents. The rulers of the Maya kingdom represented themselves as rainmakers. They were the ones who made the rains come, they were the ones who spoke to the gods, and they were the only ones that could keep everyone eating. Without them and their connection to the gods, the rains would stop and everyone would starve. To help maintain their image, the rulers of Nakum transformed the city into a water paradise. Just about every single building has a system for collecting water and funneling it into a reservoir or some other catchment system. They use every piece of ingenuity at their disposal to capture and redirect every drop of rainwater that fell from the sky. They sloped patios and plazas, they dug ditches and gutters, and they made sure their people had consistent access to drinkable water and fresh crops. Abu Simbel When you think of ancient Egypt, the archaeological sites that come to mind are probably pyramids and tombs. But there is one ancient temple complex that should really get more attention than it does. 
It's called Abu Simbel, and it's one of the strangest and most impressive structures ever completed by the Egyptians. Perhaps one of the reasons it doesn't get too much attention is that it's on the other side of the country, hundreds of miles south of the pyramids at Giza. When you're in Egypt, the only way to reach Abu Simbel is by taking a 12-hour train ride from Cairo to Aswan in the south, within walking distance to the border of Sudan. Here you can see a pair of massive temples and huge statues so big they will take your breath away. The site was originally created under the rule of Ramses II around the year 1264 BC. The temples may have been built to celebrate Ramses' great victory against the Hittite Empire at the Battle of Kadesh. However, archaeologists can't agree. They also believe the huge temples may have been built as a symbol of Egyptian power, right on the border of ancient Nubia. Whatever the case, it took at least 20 years to build the temple complex. Two of the temples are dedicated to the Egyptian gods Ra and Ptah. One is dedicated to Ramses II himself. And finally, a smaller temple was dedicated to his favorite wife, Queen Nefertari. Por Bajin Por Bajin is by far the most mysterious archaeological site anywhere in Russia. The ruins of Por Bajin are on a small island in the center of Tere Kol Lake, originally built by the local Tuvan population. The place was first discovered in 1891 and is believed to have once been a great military fortress. It is a huge rectangle with tall walls completely unreachable except by boat. It would have made an easily defendable outpost back in the 8th century AD. But modern excavations have revealed more questions than answers. Archaeologists have been puzzled by a distinct lack of evidence of human life. They haven't found scraps of pottery or random personal belongings. It almost seems as though nobody lived here. If this really was a military fortress on a secluded island in a Siberian lake, something would have been left behind. Recently, opinions have started to change. Researchers now believe this was no military fortress at all, but designed to be a Buddhist temple complex. However, it may never have been used. By analyzing isotopes inside wooden timbers used for the site's foundation, researchers dated it to approximately 777. That was during the rule of Tengri Bogu Khan, but the Khan was killed two years later after he converted to Manichaeism, and his followers rose up in opposition of this new and strange religion. The point being, it was likely the Khan who commissioned Por Bajin to be built. Then, when it was finally finished, he was killed, and none of his people were interested in using it. The Churches of the Knights Templar Matera, a perfectly modern Italian city, has been inhabited since the Neolithic era, and even though it looks like a nice place to live today, it was once called the shame of Italy because of the poor living conditions and widespread poverty there in the 1950s. But I'm here to talk about the city's more ancient structures. Within the borders of Matera are over 150 churches and other old stone structures, many of them carved into the natural rock walls of the city. There are dozens and dozens of cavern churches that were chiseled from the rocks centuries ago and still exist to this very day. Some of the cave-like structures have even been converted into chic hotels. One of the most mysterious of these structures is a complex called Convicinio di San Antonio. It consists of four churches and subterranean crypts. One of them, called the First Church, is decorated in equilateral crosses, a symbol used by the Knights Templar. Although it's unclear whether the Knights Templar ever made use of the churches and their crypts, there does seem to be some connection. Duarca The mythical city of Duarca has been detailed in legends for at least 9,000 years. It's supposedly the greatest city in the world of Hinduism, founded by none other than Krishna himself. Even the name of the city Duarca translates to Gateway to Heaven. In both the myths and the Mahabharata, which is the primary sacred Hindu text, the city is described as a place of wonder. It's said that it had many beautiful palaces constructed out of pure crystal and silver and decorated with shining emeralds. There were giant artificial lakes, roads leading through the city, and massive residential areas. However, it's a little hard to believe that such a city could have existed in India 9,000 years ago. 
long before even the Sumerian civilization of Mesopotamia came around. The truth is that even though archaeologists did indeed find the remains of a sunken city off the coast of the modern city of Dwarka, they probably aren't more than 3,000 or 3,500 years old. Still, pretty old. The ruins were uncovered in the Gulf of Cambay, suggesting there was a city there submerged by some kind of cataclysmic event. However, the stones haven't technically been dated. Researchers have only dated artifacts, things like ceramic ware that had been found in the sediment. These artifacts showed the city going back to around 900 BC. Experts believe it was still a holy city, but probably not built by an actual Hindu god. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Lost Town of Mardale There is a lost village, a tiny hamlet only visible when the water level drops, hidden underneath the Hawswater Reservoir in England. It's the town of Mardale, which was submerged back in the 1930s when the water level of the reservoir was artificially raised by about 95 feet. The reservoir has been used to serve Manchester and the surrounding area for the last 90 years. Years. But back in the 30s, the villagers were pretty unhappy to be kicked out of their homes. Hundreds of villagers were forcibly evicted in order to make way for the area to flood. Most of their houses were blown apart by royal engineers who used the structures for demolition practice. What was once a beautiful and picturesque town remains completely hidden most of the time. However, the ruins of Mardale Village can be seen when the water level in the reservoir drops any lower than 50%. But you'd really have to look hard to realize you were staring at a lost city. The buildings have been ultimately destroyed, with the only evidence of human habitation being the squat foundations that remain of the buildings. You can see the outlines of the structures long destroyed, but that is all that is left. Sunken City of Tikina Underneath the surface of Lake Titicaca in Bolivia, archaeologist Christophe Delaire of Belgium discovered the remains of an ancient civilization. With information given to him by the locals, he and his team have so far discovered over 24 submerged archaeological sites hiding underneath the shimmering blue water of the lake. The most important of these sites, at least according to the Bolivian government, is Santiago de Ojelaya. This is where the government is hoping to build a museum, both on land and in the water. That way tourists can see the ruins both at the edge of the lake and the ruins beneath the lake. Pretty cool, huh? The ruins once belonged to the pre-Inca civilization known as the Tiwanaku. The Tiwanaku began settling around Lake Titicaca in 2000 BC and continued to thrive there for 3,000 years. They reached their height around the year 500, with shocking advances in architecture and science. They built gateways that some believe were used as portals to other places in time and space. They also crafted amazing artifacts from gold and spread across the Andes Mountains into Argentina, Peru, and even Chile. But they always stuck quite close to Lake Titicaca where they believed civilization originated. It was part of their mythology that the first human had risen from the lake, and so it only made sense to keep it as their political and cultural center. The sunken cities and temples found beneath the lake likely were flooded when its water levels rose about 1,000 years ago right around the time the Tiwanaku vanished. The Kekova Ruins Kekova Island in Turkey was home to the very first democratic federation in the world. This was before the Ottoman, the Byzantine, and even the Roman empires. It was around 2000 BC when the Lycians created the first peaceful federation of city-states the world had ever known. The Lycians were a happy and prosperous people, and they built a city on Kekova Island specifically for trading at sea. It was called Simena, and it lasted for about 2200 years before it was hit by a series of earthquakes in the 2nd century AD and sunk. It really did happen that fast. The people of Simena had enjoyed centuries of prosperous trading and had been building a beautiful city on the island. Then the ground shook and all their great works of architecture fell into the water. But the city is at least still visible today. The shattered rooftops of ancient structures looking almost like the crests of coral reefs in the clear waters of the Mediterranean. There is a broken shipyard here, the foundations of old public houses, and scattered pieces of pottery on the sea floor. 
There are also Lycian tombs scattered throughout the area, both underwater and on the island. There's even one particularly striking set of stone stairs descending straight into the water, where the city had once been. The entire island today is completely abandoned. There is not a single person living here, and only a handful of goats who reside in the above-ground ruins. The whole place is a protected area, a UNESCO candidate, and a forbidden zone. You're not even allowed to dive or snorkel in the area around the sunken city without express permission from the authorities. In 2017, the Turkish government thought to potentially open the ruins for exploration to draw in tourism. Would you make the journey to visit this underwater sunken city? Let me know in the comments below. Dunwich by the Sea Dunwich was a thriving port city in the 13th century with a somewhat legendary status. In fact, Dunwich remains a city on Suffolk's coast in the UK. Quite tiny today, there are only about 200 people living in it, a single road, one pub, the ruins of a monastery, and a local museum. But in the Middle Ages, Dunwich was quite a bit larger. It was actually huge with a bustling port getting fat on fishing and trading. There was even a Greyfriars monastery established by Franciscan monks in the 1250s. The town was getting bigger and bigger, and it was spreading from the beach higher up the shore. But no amount of prosperity could save Dunwich from what came next. In the year 1286, a massive storm battered the English coastline, sweeping away the newly constructed monastery and literally sucking people's houses into the ocean. When the storm had settled and the people were able to look at the damage, they saw that their city was entirely gone. It's now sitting underneath the water, about half a mile from the coastline. Starting in the 1960s, fishermen began to catch their nets on mysterious structures underneath the water. When archaeologists went in to see what was going on, they laid eyes on Dunwich's shattered churches for the first time in over 700 years. Which city do you think is next to be swept out to sea, and how soon do you think it could happen? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. The Wickedest City Port Royal was once called the wickedest city in the world, yet it's hard to see that when looking at Port Royal today. It's a small and rather sleepy fishing village in Jamaica, located just at the mouth of Kingston Harbor. But in the 17th century, Port Royal was the very real pirate capital of the Caribbean. It was a paradise for pirates, a port city of bars and brothels where scurvy-stricken sea dogs could indulge in all kinds of sins and vices. In the 1660s, historian Charles Leslie wrote that wine and women drained pirates of their accumulated bounty so quickly that some were reduced to beggars in a single night. Pirates used their booty to purchase mass quantities of wine and take women back to their pirate lairs. Alas, the glory of Port Royal did not last as long as the pirates would have liked. It was on June 7, 1692, that an earthquake shook the Caribbean to its core. The quake was so ferocious that it caused a tsunami that came out of the water and dragged Port Royal into the sea. Roughly 2,000 people were killed and the entire city was sunk in a matter of minutes. All these years later, the ruins are still out there, just a few feet below the surface. A Prehistoric Ghost Town The English Channel is one of the most difficult places for diving. It's a huge stretch of water between the island of Great Britain and mainland Europe. It has powerful tides and extremely cold waters that make it hazardous even for the most professional divers. For these reasons, it's been difficult for marine archaeologists to reach the bottom of the seabed and see what's hiding there. Why would anyone want to go to the bottom of the channel? Because 8,000 years ago, there was no water here. The United Kingdom was still linked to Europe by a large patch of land. It wasn't until the glaciers began melting that the sea levels rose enough to turn the UK into an island. Back when this was still above water, people actually lived here. There were settlements throughout the entire region. As the water started moving in, people were forced either east or west. Some people settled in Britain, some people in France. In the 1990s, the first evidence of these prehistoric settlements was discovered by divers carrying out routine surveys. They noticed a lobster cleaning out its burrow, moving pieces of worked flint out of the sediment. Over the last 20 years, several different expeditions have gone to the bottom of the channel in search of lost settlements. And while they haven't found any towering cities under the water, they have found evidence of towns and villages. Most recently, the Maritime Archaeological Trust used new technology to scan the bottom of the channel, finding old pieces of timber and layers of wooden foundations. 
the ruins of prehistoric towns. We don't know how many are down there in the dark, and most of whatever the prehistoric people built is long gone. However, there are still vague traces of homes sitting on the bottom of the English Channel, all of them over 8,000 years old. Phanagoria Phanagoria was once the biggest ancient Greek city situated on the Taman Peninsula, a major emporium for the traffic moving between the Maeotian marshes and the southern region of the Caucasus. For those of you unfamiliar with the region, it's in the western part of Russia on the edge of the Black Sea. The city was originally founded in 543 by colonists fleeing devastation at the hands of Persia's Cyrus the Great. After a series of wars and shifts in power, the town allied with the Roman Republic. Since they had remained loyal to Rome, when the Romans began to take over the area, the people of Phanagoria were allowed to maintain themselves with a greater level of autonomy than most other conquered cities. They remained a powerful player in the region up until the 4th century AD, when the Roman Empire fell and the Huns burned the city to the ground. In the Middle Ages, the town bounced back after being utterly decimated by barbarians. It became the capital of Old Great Bulgaria in 632, then was absorbed into the Byzantine Empire. By the 10th century, it was invaded by the Rus and this time never bounced back. Even though much of the ancient city lies in ruins on the edge of the Black Sea, a large part of it is also in ruins underneath the Black Sea. About one-third of the city has fallen victim to rising water levels, with a huge portion of its ancient temples and buildings submerged under several feet of water. Olus Olus was yet another coastal city in ancient Greece that flourished because of its easy access to trade networks. It was a city positioned smartly at a maritime crossroads, which connected northern Crete with other Aegean islands in the Mediterranean. Like so many other coastal cities in Greece, Olus was plunged into the water when a great earthquake shook the region in the 2nd century AD, yet not all its history was lost. Recent underwater surveys have revealed the remains of broken structures, roads winding across the seabed, and the foundations of huge public buildings. Archaeologists have found defensive walls and towers, which likely protected the harbor city from invasion by the sea. They have also found ancient coins dating back to 330 BC, coins decorated with the heads of gods like Zeus. What's really remarkable about Olus is that the whole thing ended up being underwater. There are sunken cemeteries, marble statues buried under sediment, and even ancient tombs that are pretty much inaccessible because they are so deep underwater. Fabrica di Caregine Fabrica di Caregine isn't exactly Atlantis, but it's still one of the most mysterious lost sunken cities in the world. It's a submerged town from the medieval days, hidden beneath the water of Lago di Vagli in Tuscany. The lake is an artificial body of water, the result of flooding in 1953 when a dam was built nearby. Creating the dam meant the whole valley was going to need to be flooded, which would completely destroy the city that had been standing there since the 1200s. It was actually pretty tragic, especially from a historical standpoint. The original town had been thriving for over 800 years. Whereas many of these small Italian settlements vanished in the wake of the modern world, this one survived deep into the 20th century. Even more fascinating is that the town was occupied mainly by blacksmiths and farmers. They still practiced many old ways of life, with the 146 inhabitants farming the land, building, and surviving as if they were still living in the Middle Ages. But the flood destroyed their way of life. As the basin slowly filled, the village was lost under the water. It's still down there, and it occasionally rears its medieval head when water levels drop, but it's never going to be inhabited ever again. Thanks for watching! Which of these incredible sunken cities would you love to explore on a scuba trip? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more incredible finds! Bye!